FC 97.3. Call 0845 973 Text 84850. Next week will be dominated not just by the economic statement by the Chancellor of the Exchequer on Wednesday, but it's when we go green. Finally, the Copenhagen Summit opens on climate change. Hundreds of Hundreds and thousands of people are descending on Copenhagen for this big chance. They're talking about a last chance to save the planet. Is it really that drastic? Do you even believe in global warming? To help me through the science of global warming and climate change, I'm joined now by Professor Brian Ford, biologist and author. Uh, hello to you, Professor. Morning to you. How are you doing? Uh, uh, not bad, but the night is young, Andrew. Much can happen. Now, how significant, how worried should we be if there's not any agreement achieved at Copenhagen? Um, I'm tempted to say, because it would be the right thing to say, we should be extremely worried. But between you and me, and, and, and both the listeners, I honestly wouldn't think that it matters a fig, and I'll tell you why. Firstly, because just supposing that you and I and everybody else held our breath from this moment and switched off every power station and stopped every car so there was no more man-made CO2 ever put into the atmosphere ever again from this moment on. The levels that we've already got in the atmosphere are enough to lead to irrevocable and very dangerous climate change. So, really, there's absolutely nothing of any note that we can do. We can try and slightly delay the onslaught, I suppose, but the atmosphere is already irrevocably ruined and there isn't any way of going back on that. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that the uh, Kyoto Protocol is an interesting one. Well, I'm in Japan. I'm always very well aware of what a good place that was for it because they're very dynamic, very objective, very straightforward, very proactive people. But the protocol wasn't. All of the earlier conferences have set targets, but I'm not sure any of them have ever been reached by anybody ever. Why do you think that... The, I mean, politicians, we know what they're like, Professor. They talk the talk, walk the walk, but then, as you say, the targets are rarely achieved. Why is there such a reluctance to deliver? Oh, because of the fact that the problem that we're talking about is one that extends over, say, 50 years. And uh, as somebody famously said, politicians are here today and gone tomorrow. All the politicians are looking at is whether they can win their seats and their comfortable lifestyle for this time next year. Well, explain to the listeners, Professor, what your interpretation and what your scenario is of climate change. You say the damage is already done. How is that going to impact on our lives or maybe uh, the lives of children and grandchildren down the line? Well, would you mind, Andrew, if I go back a tiny step yeah. further than that and just, just deal with climate change mm. in the general sense? Please. I mean, why is everybody so steamed up about climate change? The climate has always changed. We used to have ice ages. In 1972, my old friend Nigel Calder did a programme on BBC Two, a two-hour special about the coming ice age and saying how everybody would be living in subterranean cities because the whole world was going to be covered in ice and snow because of the amount of emissions from factories that would cut down the access of sunlight to the Earth's surface. It may be that, in fact, we are supposed to be going into an ice age. The timing is about right and that the increase in CO2 has stopped us from freezing up. But the climate has always changed. What is its obsession with the fact that it's got to stay the same? They used to grow grapes outside the castle wall in Cardiff. They used to have an annual ice fair on the Thames in London. That was when it was much warmer and much colder than it is now. The climate always has changed. But the issue is, is the Earth getting warmer? And you don't need to be a scientist for that. I've got a sledge in my, in my shed. So when I was a kid, every year in the 50s, it was always out on the snow, every single January. We used it last winter, and that's the first time for 18 years. People listening at home have got hardy bananas growing in their garden. They've got tree ferns in the, in the public park. 20 years ago, they couldn't grow. Everybody knows that it's getting warmer. There isn't any doubt about that. But the reason people are getting concerned is because the pressures on many scientists are such, you know, to produce results, that they actually start fiddling the results and twisting the truth in order to prove that they are right. And that's where the problem with East Anglia University came yeah. in. No. Because, um, um, by the way, did you, did you see it's on YouTube, I think, somebody in America announced it as the University of Angela, which I thought was quite good. Somebody mistyped it. Yeah. obviously never heard of where it was. But these guys, such are the pressures of government now for scientists to pull in the results, 
these guys are actually fiddling their results and trying to block the publication of figures in order to substantiate what it is that they believe. I but, mean, it's always become a religious campaign. But if the world is getting warmer, Professor, uh, is that as a direct result of all the... Uh uh, chemicals and industrial filth that's being belched into the sky that wasn't that wasn't a factor which caused the climate change uh, thousands of years ago there, there were other factors presumably should we uh, should we be worried that the world is getting warmer of course we should because it isn't sustainable um uh, by the way do stop this professor malarkey it's an honorary title oh, all right. I, just, I wish you'd call me brian i've been broadcasting since you were probably in the junior school bless you that probably not than that but uh, but of course we should be worried Look at Tuvalu. This is the country whose domain name is .tv, and they make much of their money by selling TV domains to all the television companies around the world. But these people are up to their ankles in water because their country is being taken over by these slowly but inexorably rising seas. And the reason the seas are rising is not because of melting ice. Everybody thinks it is. But it's not because of melting ice. Liquids expand when they get warmer, like the mm. alcohol or mercury in a thermometer. Mm. The sea is actually getting warmer, and it's actually getting bigger. The water is expanding, and that is the reason, not melting ice, why the tidal levels are creeping slowly upwards. But of course it's a serious problem. And do you think there is... Well, you've already argued that um, uh, if the damage is done. Is there anything really that can be achieved by the, uh, the great and the good in, um, in Copenhagen that can slow the process down, maybe? Well, are they great? Yes. Are they good? Hope so. We can slow the process down if we can reduce our emission of CO2. Nobody has ever doubted that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere traps heat. Everybody has agreed on that. The only question is, is it caused by man? And some people say, well... I don't believe it's man-made. I believe it's a natural cycle. That could be right. Mm. But that isn't an answer to the problem, because if it is a natural cycle, and we're supposed to be getting warm anyway, then putting still more carbon dioxide in the air to make it still worse is not a really sensible answer, is it? Whatever your view on whether it's man-made or not, the levels of CO2 have got to be curtailed. But our main priority is not just to put up tokens like these ghastly windmills all over the countryside, <laughs> uh, which can have far less effect than everybody seems to think. What we need to do is to batten down the hatches and start to prepare for a very different world, which means looking after national interests, but also making sure that international interests are looked after. The future cannot be the same, and we should really be planning for the change I'm not arguing about whether we can reduce the change. Well, let me ask you just about, with your uh, professor's hat on, or scientist's hat on, about some of the ideas uh, to try to reduce uh, our carbon emissions. What about electric cars? Are they a good idea? Well, I, I remember writing in The Guardian, God, it must be 20 years ago, that electric cars aren't a good idea because an electric car of the same power, or the same horsepower as a regular car, is going to be getting its electricity from its battery. You plug it into the wall... And where does the juice come from? It comes from the power station down the road that's belting out its CO2. Yeah. So, in fact, an electric car is less efficient, more polluting, power for power, horsepower for horsepower, than a regular petrol car. Isn't that funny? So, no, and yet they go fussing on about it, don't they, politicians? Yeah, they do. And they also say how quiet they are, which is great until one creeps up behind you at 40 miles an hour and smacks you on the fly. And what about eco-towns? Uh, well, it, it's just 13 of, 13 of them have been approved. I know, it's a buzzword, isn't it? Yeah. The eco-towns may, in fact, push out far less CO2 than regular towns. And that's great. It means that instead of them putting out huge amounts of extra CO2 on top of the colossal amount that's already there, they'll be putting out a lesser amount, which is great, but it's not an answer. Uh, unless every town in the world became an eco-town tomorrow, then, of course, you might be talking. All right, and just briefly, uh, wind farms. Were they oh, proposing a, me. a big one in the uh, Thames estuary? Well, you see... I was watching one of the BBC programs. It was John, John Craven the other day was, was uh, looking at a, a wind uh, generator and saying, why, why haven't we got all of our electricity coming from these? They're wonderful. Of course they're not. The one time when demand for power is at its all-time highest is in the middle of winter when it's well below freezing, there isn't a breath of wind, no turbine is turning, and the temperatures plummet down to minus 8, minus 10 degrees. That is when we need all our electrical power. There won't be any from the wind, 
So whether we had wind farms or not, we've got to have nuclear or conventional power stations to produce it then. And the other thing is this. When you look at the windmill, you only see the bit that's sticking up. The bit in the ground is an absolutely vast swimming pool-sized lake of concrete. And the amount of CO2 that's produced in making the cement is colossal. And I can't persuade myself that the amount of CO2 that is given out in making the things is necessarily going to be balanced by the CO2 they save during their lifetime of 20 years. All right, that's, um, that's Professor Brian Ford. Um, he prefers just to be called Brian Ford, but he is a professor, actually. He's a biologist and author and uh, very knowledgeable.